Welcome to this video on UTIs and the microbiome. During my consultations, I've had a number of women tell me that they have or have had UTIs, some chronically, and of course, all have taken rounds of antibiotics for them, and at times, the bacterium in question, usually a strain of E. coli, are resistant to antibiotics. So what is to be done for these women, and for men as well? What is the connection to the microbiome? So if you're tired of using cranberry, d mannose and other supplements to no avail, then keep watching. If you're new, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and also follow me on Instagram and Facebook as The Microbiome Expert. In the United States, 15% of antibiotics are prescribed for the treatment of urinary tract infections, UTIs. For those suffering acute UTIs, 25% experience recurrent UTIs. But ironically, like a C. diff infection, antibiotic use is also a significant risk factor for a UTI. The pathogenesis of the UTI typically starts with the contamination of the periurethral space by uropathogens residing in the gut, followed by colonization of the urethra and ascending migration to the bladder. UTIs are predominantly caused by E. coli, which is responsible for over 80% of community-acquired infections, while healthcare-related infections, think catheter in the hospital, are associated with Staphylococcus, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, Proteus, and Enterococcus. Do these names sound familiar? E. coli, Staphylococcus, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, Enterococcus, names I mention all of the time in my videos. Studies show that the majority of UTI-causing E. coli are resident in the gut at the time of the UTI. So the gut is the main source for a UTI. In our previous slide, we talked about bacterial contamination via the exterior, which, for example, could be due to sexual intercourse or improper wiping. And for obvious anatomical reasons, women are more susceptible than are men. But here in Figure 1, we will talk about translocation. I mention all the time that with gut permeability, parts of bacteria or whole bacteria can escape the gut and go systemic. In fact, if you recall some of my slides, even the healthy have detectable levels of bacteria in their blood. It's just less and comprised of a different set of bacterial DNA. Well, here we see the gut-kidney access the gut-bladder access, and the vagina-bladder access, and the gut-vagina access. Although the gut is the primary reservoir for the bacteria that drive UTIs, the vagina can be one as well, as we will now see. But first, take a minute to pause and read these important comments. In Table 2, we see that in this study, the women with recurrent UTIs have significant more vaginal E. coli than did the healthy controls. Keep in mind that all E. coli is not the same, more on that later. And this is one of a number of studies which shows this. When women take antibiotics for any reason, not only does the gut microbiome suffer, but so does the vaginal microbiome. If you're familiar with my videos, you know that I'm not a fan of lactobacillus. But when it comes to vaginal health, the story is different. Those antibiotics will kill off the health-promoting species from lactobacillus and the vagina, most notably L. crispatus. This paves the way for not only E. coli and other nefarious bacteria, but yeast infections as well. For more on this, see my video. To reinforce this connection, we have this study, which looked at antibiotic use and the risk of cystitis in UTIs. They found that the risk for a UTI 15 to 28 days post-antibiotics was more than 2.5-fold in one cohort of 326 women and a whopping almost 6-fold in a cohort of 425 other women. But when they looked within 14 days, the risk was not significantly different. This makes sense, right? Antibiotics kill bacteria both good and bad. But following discontinuation, the bad actors rebound faster and stronger. With repeated exposure, the good bacteria tend to get killed off, or at the very least, sidelined, while the antibiotic-driven environmental shift favors the bad guys. For more on this, see my important video here. So let's return to the gut. 
Here is another study which reinforces the connection between the gut microbiome and recurrent UTIs. There are a couple interesting findings. One, that a bloom in the gut pathogens was associated with a following UTI. How can you get a bloom in pathogens? Lots of ways. Could be stress, could be a virus, or it could be antibiotics for some other reason. Their other interesting point is that even though you may clear the pathogen from your UTI, the genetically identical strain still exists in the intestinal reservoir able to continue the ugly cycle of recurrence. Now, you may have seen this UPEC in previous slides. It stands for uropathogenic E. coli, which means that it's a variant of E. coli that has developed some nasty capabilities. They are listed here. Basically, it's expressing factors that make it more virulent, more nasty. But this list, which encompasses things I've talked about before, like flagella and siderophores, are not just specific to UTIs. This is what happens in the gut when the environment favors the opportunistic pathogens. For more on this, see this video. So I'm not a fan of the term UPEC. It makes it sound like there is a specific strain of E. coli that is somehow magically getting into your urinary tract. We need to understand that in the inflamed gut, the environment is such which favors the genetic expression of the virulence factors. E. coli is a normal inhabitant of the gut, but in the healthy microbiome, its pathogenic potential is kept in check. And in this paper, the authors found no genetic signature for UPEC strains, reinforcing my viewpoint. Take a moment to read one of their quotes. I hope you're enjoying the video so far. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and recommend to friends and family. Also, if you're feeling extra generous, hit the super thanks below. So what's in the healthy microbiome that keeps the bad actors in check? An abundance of good bacteria, primarily butyrate producers. And despite what some crazy carnivore fanatics say on my YouTube channel, the people who know what they are talking about repeatedly say that the short-chain fatty acids, which result from the fermentation of dietary fibers, are health-promoting and keep pathogens in check. One way is by reducing the pH of the gut lumen. As shown in Figure 2, a pH of 6.5 significantly downregulated virulence gene expression. The short-chain fatty acids, especially butyrate, do many wonderful things in the gut. But one important mechanism is maintaining the pH in the Goldilocks zone. I talk about this in my very important video on pH. At acidic pH, undisassociated short-chain fatty acids can freely diffuse through cell membranes and concentrate in bacterial cytoplasm, resulting in reduction of the intracellular pH. Acidified bacterial cells have reduced transmembrane potentials and disrupted cellular biological activities, such as DNA replication. But when the pH rises, it favors the opportunistic pathogens, their growth, virulence factor, virulence gene expression, and driving a downward spiral of inflammation which favors them. Under these circumstances, the good bacteria are sidelined and outcompeted for fuel. You can take all the antibiotics and natural antimicrobials you want, but they won't give you the long-term solution you're looking for. I focus on driving a significant shift in the gut environment to one that favors the health promoters so they can manage the bad actors for us. And then we see, like in Table 3, reduced expression of pathogenic genetic expression of adhesion, invasion, iron theft, and toxins. As the former director of medical education for a microbiome firm, and now with my own platform, I have helped legions of people from around the world using my unique philosophy, one focused on supporting the butyrate-producing bacteria. And who are these health-promoting bacteria? who decrease the pH by producing short-chain fatty acids, butyrate in particular, the usual suspects I mentioned all the time. In this paper, women with a history of recurrent UTIs were compared to controls, and as is the case in my other videos, not surprisingly, the healthy controls had significantly more F. prausitii, subdoli granulum, E. rectale, and E. halii, in their gut microbiomes. If you're not familiar with my videos, these are just four of the classic good guys I'm always talking about. 
In fact, F. Prausitii has its own video. You can check that out. Also read these two important comments here. And to reinforce the point further, we have another paper again showing similar results. We see Eubacterium, Ruminococcus, Roseburia, Fusicatenibacter, Ocillibacter, and Lachnospira all significantly higher in the gut microbiomes of the healthy controls as compared to those with recurrent UTIs. Again, taxa I always mention as pH, oxygen, antibiotic sensitive, butyrate producing health promoters. And I want to read this important quote to help drive home the message. Quote, the gut in particular is a known reservoir for UPEC from which multiple episodes of UTI can be seeded. In healthy individuals, commensal microbiota populating the gut can provide colonization resistance against pathogenic enterobacteriales through competitive exclusion or by modulating host immunity. I love to use fecal microbiota transfer, FMT studies, as they truly show the power of the microbiome. In fact, I have a great video dedicated to FMT. You should check it out. So here we have a case study of this poor 83-year-old woman who has been through the ringer. On top of her other problems, she has had a 25-year history of recurrent UTIs, for which I'm sure she got boatloads of antibiotics. And then, not surprisingly, went on to develop a C. diff infection. Again, the number one cause for a C. diff infection is excessive antibiotic use. Anyway, she was given FMT, and guess what happened? Nine days post-FMT, she had complete resolution of all UTI and C. diff infection symptoms. At 25 months post-FMT, there was no recurrence. Affecting the urinary tract microbiome by changing the gut microbiome. So you say, guy, that's just one woman. Okay, I have this FMT study for you then. Here we have eight patients with an average age of 78 who had three or more UTIs in the year preceding FMT. As you can see here, there was a large drop-off in UTI recurrence in the year following the FMT. Take the time to read their comments here. And I'll read one other for you. Quote, Antimicrobial resistance patterns from the isolates demonstrated an improved susceptibility to antibiotics after FMT, suggesting gut decolonization of MDROs or a reduction in the concentration of these organisms below a threshold to cause UTI. Conceptually, FMT may have reduced colonization with multi-drug resistant E. coli clones such as ST131 sequence type in favor of less pathogenic E. coli clones or other largely commensal enteric organisms. One UTI can happen. Recurrent UTIs are an indication that you are dysbiotic. You can keep throwing antibiotics at your UTIs, but odds are you won't kill off all members of the guilty party hanging out in the gut reservoir as well. And in time, those antibiotics will worsen your dysbiosis. In addition, one or more bacteria responsible for your UTIs could become antibiotic resistant. Then what are you going to do? I don't offer up FMTs. What I offer up is the next best thing, and less costly and less invasive. I don't believe in bug killing. I believe in changing the environment of the gut to favor the health promoters and sideline the opportunistic pathogens. This in turn has many effects, which you can learn about in my videos. But when it comes to UTIs, it positively affects inflammatory-driven pathogenic virulence and bacterial translocation. Go to my website, themicrobiomexpert.com, and check out my new UTI protocol. Also, feel free to share your UTI story in the comments section. If you liked the video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, somewhere around here, you can go to my website where you can schedule a consultation with me. You can also view the protocols. And here, you can watch the next video.